Welcome. My name is Jonathan Coppell. I'm Dean of the College of Public Service and Community Solutions, and this is our third version of our Public Service Impact Talks. I'm really excited about these talks because one of the, one of the things they do, which we don't actually get much of a chance to, uh, to offer, is, a chance, is an opportunity for people to hear a little bit more about what our faculty what our faculty are actually doing and what their research is about and how they are serving the mission of the college, which is to address the most pressing issues in our community and figure out what are solutions to these challenges. As I've talked about in previous gatherings, we changed the name of the college. We are the college formerly known as the College of Public Programs, but we changed the name of the college to be reflective of our mission, which is to address um, to address challenges and come up with solutions. One of them is by training our students at the undergraduate, masters, and doctoral level to be engaged in public service, hence the public service part. And the solutions part is about finding answers to these challenges. The last, uh, or the first one of these gatherings, we heard from uh, several members of our School of Social Work faculty. And I have to apologize, I can't stick with you because we have a School of Social Work gathering uh, across the street that I'm going to go to. Um, but that covered a broad range of issues, uh, talked about uh, Dr. Carney's uh, uh, research on domestic violence, uh, Dominique Rosepowitz talked about her work on human trafficking, and Joanne Cacciatore uh, talked about her work on working, uh, working with families um, grieving the loss of a child. So a broad range of subjects, just three, three of the faculty members in the School of Social Work. Uh, subsequently, we had a set of talks that were around the Super Bowl. Um, so David Swindell in the School of Public Affairs talked about financing sports facilities and some of the dilemmas of municipalities investing in sports. Uh, Scott Decker, while well, he was scheduled to, it didn't actually happen, but was scheduled to talk about gangs and the interaction between professional sports and gangs. And the third one, Mary and Mary Feeney, uh, another professor in the School of Public Affairs, talked about the NFL as a nonprofit organization. Actually, you might have heard, you might have heard her on the radio talking about this topic because there was some attention to the fact that the the president of a nonprofit organization makes eight gajillion dollars a year. Um, Forty-four. What was it? Forty-four. Forty-four million dollars a year. Um, so tonight um, we're hearing from uh, three representatives of the School of Community Resources and Development. School of Community Resources and Development and uh, its director Kathy Andrek will be your host uh, following my departure. Uh, is perhaps the most varied school in the college. It covers a broad range of subjects, um, including parks and recreation, nonprofit leadership and management, um, and tourism. Uh, and so you're going to get a flavor for that. You're going to get a flavor for that tonight uh, through two faculty members and one outstanding doctoral student. I wanted to make a point, and this is going to make a very elegant segue, uh, very elegant segue to the first speaker, of welcoming uh, many uh, members of the ASU Emeritus College who participate in the college's art uh, advocacy and, uh, program. So over in the UCEN building, we have the benefit of having terrific art produced by our ASU Emeritus artists, as well as artists from the community. And the purpose of this art program, which was created by my predecessor, Deborah Friedman, was to use art uh, as a mechanism to build community. It was also to do something with the acres of blank walls in the USF building. But it was really about building community. Um, but I was just speaking about this uh, at a reception for our artists. It really is one of the most powerful aspects of art, that it can bring people together. It creates exchange of ideas, it creates dialogue. Um, it's, an amazing, it's an amazing force, and we don't often appreciate art in that level. And as you can imagine, in the School of Community Development, uh, Art is a subject that uh, that comes up, and the power of art to build community comes up. And so, our first speaker, Tiffany Ord, is a second year. Second year? Mm -hmm. How can you already have a job? Your second year. <laughs> a second year, a second year doctoral student in the program, who is going to give a talk about her work on art as a community building instrument in refugee camps. And I, I, I was, I would pretend to remember the name, but I'm going to mess it up. In the Sarawi, 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 
Sahrawi refugee camp in the west. Uh, that's in the Western Sahara, right? Uh, and so uh, it's an interesting it's an interesting uh, connection. We just come from talking about art building community uh, in our college and here in Phoenix, and Tiffany's going to talk about art building community in the context of a refugee uh, a refugee camp uh, in Africa. So. Thank you so much for participating in this event. I'm, uh, I'm extremely excited to welcome you here. I, uh, you know, I, uh, I wish that more people get to see what I get to see as dean of the college, which is the amazing work that our individual faculty members and students are doing. Unfortunately, not enough of that gets to the community. So this is a window into what we do, and uh, very excited that you're here to share this with us. And again, I apologize that I'm going to have to step out midway through, but I'm sure you're going to have a you're going to have an excellent time. And after Tiffany, you're going to hear from Christine Bazinda and Dave White, two of our superstar our superstar faculty members. Christine's going to be talking about tourism and the way in which we as tourists can make a contribution to the communities we visit. And Dave's going to talk about what we do in Arizona when all the water runs out. <laughs> um, so, uh, so uh, enjoy the evening, and uh, I look forward to seeing you at future installments of these talks, which we expect the next one will be forthcoming in September. Um, and I think, I think criminology, you guys are on. You guys are probably on tap. So <laughs> get ready. Uh, very good. Welcome, and uh, I'll see you at the end of the show. Bye. -bye. Thank you very much. That was a wonderful segue into speaking about arts for community building and activism. And today we're going to be talking about arts and culture-based activism in the Sahrawi refugee camps in southwestern Algeria. So of course that uh, we have a very small time together today. I could probably talk about this for many hours, uh, so I'll probably be using my nose here or there to stay on track as I uh, did a talk at the local the Global Justice Festival a few weeks ago. It was an hour and a half long, and at the very end of it, I still had 32 slides left. <laughs> so I won't do that to you here today. But um, So we'll just kind of try to go quickly. And uh, today we're going to talk about who are the Sahrawi? Uh, why is arts and culture-based uh, activism being utilized? What's the need? What are the strategies being employed? And then the impacts to the community and the cause. So let's start off with where we are geographically in the world, where we're talking about. We're talking about the Western Sahara, which is located in northern Africa. You will note that most maps that you will see of Africa, that this section is usually gray. The reason for that is because it's a, an area that is under dispute, and it's very difficult for external organizations, journalists, nonprofits, to actually access this territory and monitor human rights and things of that nature. So many times it is a gray area on the map. So regionally, just looking at the Western Sahara, you will see that the purple area is the Moroccan occupied territory, and the kind of goldy beige is the Polisario held territory. The Polisario is the uh, government in exile for the Sahrawi people, the representative government. And um, before I get back to the map of explaining what that blue thing is in the middle that might look like a river, is just to, to briefly go over a little bit of the history of the conflict. Again, it's a very complex, highly contested um, history, and there are multiple viewpoints to be had, both on the Kingdom of Morocco side, as well as the Polisario Front, Mauritania. There are many in Spain that was the colonizing power. So I'm not going to get into a lot of that history, but I do encourage you to very much do your own exploration and look at the history for yourself. I can provide some resources afterward. Um, if anyone wants to see just a short YouTube video that shows a very uh, short and sweet, if you can um, call it that, uh, overview of the conflict. So when Spain left the Spanish um, Western Sahara, as it was called at the time in the 70s, they, um, under pressure to decolonize, then Morocco and Mauritania both came in, Morocco from the north, Mauritania from the south, to take over that uh, geographic area of the Western Sahara. There were already tri tribal and nomadic peoples living there, called the Sahrawi, and um, so this started a war, and eventually Mauritania pulled out, but um, Morocco and the Polisario continued to fight for almost two decades. 
and um, also while the, the Sahrawi people were um, being driven out of this territory, napalm and white phosphorus were utilized on them. And so many people fled out to the open desert of Algeria to where they are this day, 40 years later, in long-term refugee camps. And then many stayed behind in the what they termed to be the occupied zone. Um, so back to this map, this blue area in the middle is actually a 40 200 kilometer long berm, earthen berm, called the wall, that is um, covered with active landmines and uh, Moroccan troops. And so over the past 40 years, those people that were um, either chose to flee into the desert that now live in the refugee camps, or those that chose to stay in the occupied territory of Morocco, administered by Morocco, have, uh, many have not seen each other for 40 years. So many families were separated during this time. So who are the Sahrawi? They speak a sub-dialect of Arabic, a very unique sub-dialect of Arabic called Hassaniya. And um, it is a very complex and regional hybrid of an identity. But um, Sahrawi very much means people of the Sahara Desert. So the human rights aspect of this is very important to understand. In October, from October, October to November of 2010, something very important happened, was um, this uh, Gedim Azik, if anyone has heard of the, the camp that was set up by Sahrawi in the occupied zone of Morocco for um, about a month, month and a half. Um, it was then very aggressively uh, dismantled, and there were many people that were injured and hurt during this time. And um, Noam Chomsky has repeatedly said that he felt that this was the true beginning of the Arab Spring. And um, the human rights within the territory of the Western Sahara, again, I would encourage you to go to Human Rights Watch, Amnesty International, and the Robert F. Kennedy uh, Center for Justice and Human Rights, as they have very full and detailed reports on the human rights situation still going on there today. So why did I become involved in uh, this refugee camp in southwest Algeria that I didn't even know existed up until that point? When I spoke to a friend of mine, I actually went to Morocco in 2012 and was extremely deeply and profoundly connected to the Sahara Desert, something I still cannot explain, but if we ever have coffee sometime, I'll share my travel experiences with you. It was phenomenal. Um, but I, I love the people, I love the place, and so later when I was telling a friend of mine about how spectacular Morocco was, she then went on an educational trip there, learned of Arti Fariti, and shared that information with me, and I was, I was floored. I had no idea what was happening. Um, I was like most other um, Americans in that I had no clue that this 40-year-old conflict was still happening. And so I uh, went to these, the uh, Arti Fariti Arts Festival in November of 2013 to do some exploratory research. And this is a view outside of our Haima, which is a desert tent where we stayed with the host family in Camp Bouchdor. And as you can see, uh, there's, there's a lot of um, poverty in the refugee camps, and they don't have a lot of, um, they don't have running water, not much electricity, uh, a lot of malnutrition. They rely exclusively on international aid for both food and water. And the desert conditions are very harsh. It's very cold at night, very hot in the summer, and they're exposed to extreme conditions. And so the Polisario government, um, after having conflict with Morocco, active conflict for almost two decades, there was a peace treaty signed in 1991 with the understanding that there would be a referendum that the Sahrawi people could vote uh, for their self-determination. Were they going to stay under the administrative control of Morocco, or did they want to look at the option of having a sovereign nation or some other option? So a vote uh, was promised by this referendum for the peace treaty in 1991. And then nothing has really ever happened with that. And again, you can do, do your own research for the reasons why that, that is still so. But to this day, there's still no vote. Um, so the people are still <coughs> fighting for their self-determination, for the right to vote. And um, so what they, the, the government did, they decided to get the help of international NGOs, international activists, academics, and others to support an arts and culture-based strategy 
for activism instead of picking up arms or continuing to fight. And so they, it's a collective action against what they call the blue wall that I showed you, they call the wall of shame, that fractures Western Sahara into separating Sahrawi families between occupation and exile. These and uh, their annual encounters are a tool to reclaim the rights of individuals and peoples to their land, their culture, their roots, and their freedom. And so this is just an example of some pictures that I took during the uh, festival. This is an art training that is going on, uh, collaboration between international artists and artists there in the camp. There were a variety of arts that, that took place during the week. Uh, visual arts, there were painting, uh, sculpture, um, many, many different things happened, music. Um, art is also used as remembrance because over the 40 years, there have been countless that have been disappeared or um, detained in prisons and not heard from again, so their family members are never really sure what happened to them. And so um, art is also a way that the community can then work with international artists that come into the camp to do drawings of their family members <coughs> as they have no pictures of them. And this is one project with a group I'm actually now affiliated with called Arts Action Group, where we um, went into the primary school in the refugee camp and used art to examine issues surrounding access to clean water. And we also brought some water packs that when you put the water into the water pack that um, it's sterilized and they're able to carry it. And, and there were some other water-related projects that happened. And this all came from our exposure through attending rt 4 t so also during the RT Free Tea Festival, there are many different educational sessions. This one here um, highlights an international human rights lawyer that was instrumental in the East Timor case. And he states that East Timor and Western Sahara are like two drops of water, that the situation is so similar to one another. East Timor has actually uh, realized its self-determination. Western Sahara has not gotten to that point yet. But he was there to give an overview of what he did in East Timor, try to help build strategies, political strategies, with the people there in the camps. There was also a professor from New York University that gave a lecture on uh, self-determination movements, utilizing arts and self-determination movements. So it was a, there's a very large component of education that also works with uh, this art activism. So this is another project that came out of RT It is called Sahara Libre Wear, which is high-end resistance fashion. And I was lucky enough to be um, voluntold to be a part of the fashion show, which was so humiliating. Um, I will not show you the video. But um, so that they, they're screen printing there in the camps. Uh, the women uh, make a lot of the designs, and it's meant to honor their traditional designs, like the Melfa, the traditional women's dress that they wear, but to do it more in kind of an impactful way with resistance-type slogans and whatnot. You can see there a boy that he's walking on the, the runway uh, during this, this uh, fashion show. Another project that has come from uh, Arts Action Group and in uh, conjunction with Adelphi University is called Shared Roots. And it is a project to help people, being that there's, there's no video and audio equipment there in the camps, is to help them document their oral history. Traditionally, they're very oral, um, nomadic, and tribal peoples. And so um, for the past 40 years, they've been in these refugee camps. So cultural knowledge loss is extremely, extremely important to them because the elders who live the traditional nomadic lifestyle out in the open desert, they pass their um, traditional ecological cultural knowledge through stories and through, through proverbs and through poetry to one another. Well, since that, that lifestyle is no longer now able to take place because the Western Sahara is fractured by not only a wall, but active landmines and things of that nature, um, the younger people who have been living in the refugee camps for the past 40 years have absolutely no clue what it's like to live in that way. And so they feel like their traditional cultural knowledge is really being lost as the older generation passes away. So this is a, um, a project to document that oral history. 
there's a lot of internal and external involvement. Many of the nonprofit organizations that are part of this are Spanish, or um, there's one from the UK that I'm familiar with. Our uh, Arts Action Group is based in New York. But there's also, so that's kind of talking about RT for ET, the arts festival. There is also, again, Summer of Libre Wear, which is fashion. There is Sand Blast, which is a music studio. There is uh, Fee Sahara, which is a film festival that I will be attending next week. And they have also built, and, and this shows, I think, the commitment to utilizing arts, is they have built an art school, a music school, and a film school there in the refugee camps to help uh, teach young people these different um, uh, tools. And, and that is a good point as well, is even though the ability to use art to express themselves is very much a positive, it is a strategic tool in activism. That is the reason. Um, and then there are other forms of art in the camp, ceramics, theater, and things of that nature. So again, I'll be going to the Sahara, uh, the Fi Sahara Film Festival next week in Camp Dakla, and it is termed the world's most remote film festival. <laughs> so I am extremely excited and intrigued to be able to go and do that, and I hope to continue my research there and looking at how culture and arts are being used to not only build community, but for activism. So uh, I have a privilege of standing here before you today. I have a privilege of obtaining education. I have access. And I have the ability to talk with you t tonight. But this is not my story. This is the, s the story of the Sahara people. And so I contacted my dear friend, translator, and very talented artist, um, Mohammed. And he is a, a calligrapher. He does poetry. He's a photographer, an amazing artist who's lived in the camps his entire life. And I asked him to take a look at my presentation and tell me what he thought about it. Um, this goes a little bit into the community-based research that I hope to do for the remainder of my career. And this is what he had to say, and I kind of broke it up into some themes. Art for Empowerment um, looks at connection, shared meaning, and strengthening community. He said, art engages people on a different level. It helps to keep the Sahrawi identity alive, communicates this message to the world and humanity, we learn from others and share with them. Through arts and culture, we have expressed our will, but it has also strengthened our community. And then looking at agency and empowerment, viewing themselves as active and not passive, he says, through music, poetry, um, oral history, I hope we can change our image of being simply refugees, looked at as castaways into the desert, disconnected, a passive people that things are being done to. Yes, I'm a refugee. But I'm building something. I'm creating. So there is a lot of hardship, but there is still continued hope. He says, art can use the little that we have to create something beautiful and useful. If you just live as a refugee, if you don't have meaning to your life, it can be very easy to lose hope and get discouraged. It has been 40 years, not days, weeks, or months, but 40 years. It is not easy to believe that art can, believe, can bring the change that you want. It is not easy to keep people waiting for a resolution, but still people try to express themselves, to communicate. They still believe in nonviolence and peaceful expression. And then at the festival, it isn't like everyone's daily life. You actually get someone to listen to you, and that doesn't happen very often. And so the real question here is, does it make a difference? You know, arts and culture, they're utilized for many different things in community building and community development and activism, but does it really work? So, due to the media surrounding this event, I had the opportunity to speak with the U.S. Ambassador to the Western Sahara, representing the Polisario Front. That was a nerve-wracking phone call um, yesterday morning. And so I was like, hello, Ambassador. Okay, so it was a very uh, interesting experience, but I had the opportunity to ask him as well what he thought and if there was actually an impact. And what he had to say was that people had went through armed struggle for 18 years. It's been peaceful for 24 years since 1991, but we have found that arts and culture are more powerful, a more powerful tool than arms and violence. I think that is such an amazing statement. 
And he cited things um, like, I don't know if many of you are familiar with the documentary by Javier, Bar uh, Javier Bardem. He came to Pisahara a few years ago and then created Sons of the Clouds. Um, then there was also uh, a lot of um, press due to some Americans coming to RT3T a couple of years ago. So these are just some, some very important things that he noted to start educating not only Americans but the world about the Saharawi uh, cause. And so I will just leave you with the thoughts of exploring more for yourselves about what is happening with arts and culture in the Western Sahara. And as a nonviolent expression of creativity, community building, and activism for the Saharawi people. Thank you very much. students so you can see what kind of you know, quality of people that we have in the school just by her, her presentation and uh, Jonathan mentioned that she has a job already and uh, so she's going off at the end of the semester but it's it's really exciting for her it's at uh, Northeast State University in Northeastern Oklahoma which is home and she'll be a faculty member in the Department of Cherokee and Indigenous Studies She's a member of the Cherokee Nation, and so she'll be able to contribute in a lot of different ways and, and has a strong interest in, in working with indigenous people. So congratulations on that. So our next speaker. <laughs> our next speaker is Dr. Christine Buzinde. And uh, Christine is an associate professor in the school. She's been with us, what, this is your third year? Is that right? Um, we, we still, is it third? No, no, no. Yeah. Not yet. Okay. I, I, I can't keep track of that. We, we stole her from Penn State, and it was definitely our game in their lives. Um, Christine is a, a faculty member in our tourism program. She studies sustainable tourism. She looks at things like the way tourism is represented in, in media and culture, for example. But she does a number of other things, too. So tonight, Christine is going to talk to you a little bit about how we, as, as tourists in a community, um, can help contribute that community as opposed to just being there kind of for our own gratification. Christine? Thank you. Good evening. My goal is to encourage you to think of tourism from a different perspective. A perspective that will yield greater health benefits for you, the individual, potential tourists, but also a perspective that will contribute positively to the communities that we visit. Before we begin that discussion, I'd like for us to engage in a small exercise. So in preparation for this exercise, I ask you to take a moment to relax, put down anything you might be holding in your hands, sink into your seats, put your feet up if your heart so desires. <laughs> and when you're ready, go ahead and close your eyes. Imagine you're on vacation. This vacation is taking place in a nation of your choice, perhaps located in Latin America, Africa, or Asia. Feel free to take anyone with you, friends, family members, pack into the family pet. I'd like you to take a moment to truly envision yourself within this space. Truly see yourself. Perhaps you're overlooking a mountaintop. Perhaps you're by the ocean. Perhaps you're in nature. Truly see your presence within that space. Take a moment to register the sentiments that arise for you as you contemplate being on vacation, elation, happiness, relaxation, whatever it might be, take note of it. Now I'm going to ask you to snap a picture. 
Now please do not reach for the high-tech cameras on your high-tech cell phones, but rather use your mind's eye to capture this photographic essence of your presence at this destination. If you had a change of heart regarding a friend or family member you took with you, perhaps your mother-in-law or father-in-law, <laughs> Photoshop them out. <laughs> They'll never know. When you're ready, go ahead and let your eyes gently open. Welcome back, everyone. I trust you all went on a very fun mini vacation. If we were to look at the images that you captured during this process, we might see some of you by a poolside or an ocean front on a hammock with a daiquiri or a margarita in hand. Others might be atop a mountain overlooking a lush tropical forest after an enjoyable hike. Some of you might be admiring the intricate architecture of a local cultural heritage site. If descriptors were attached to the images that you took to encapsulate the sentiments that you were feeling, we may see words and phrases such as joy, elation, relaxation, me time, family time, escape, getaway. For you see, within modern society, we work long hours. And the result of this amount that we dedicate to work, we look to the touristic destinations and the touristic experiences as magical locales that will magically transform our work-induced stress into relaxation and re rejuvenation. We look to these sites and we contemplate our encounter with them and we say the only way we can actually envision ourselves within that space is through hedonistic enjoyment. The long hours we work the short nature of vacations, the fact that we actually have to pay a pretty penny for these experiences, lead us to believe that our touristic experiences, our engagements in them, is a privilege that we deserve and a right that we have earned. Now, what if I was to say to you that we should not look to them as a privilege that we deserve? or a right that we have earned. They are neither a privilege that we deserve nor a right that we have earned. What a bummer, you might say. <laughs> <laughs> now, if you follow the arguments I'm about to make, I'll at least, at the very least, be able to convince you that I am not the Grinch that stole your vacation. <laughs> For you see, when we adopt a philosophy where we look for touristic experiences as a privilege that we deserve and a right that we have earned, we adopt a very self-centric approach to this. We look to these touristic destinations and we say, all I want from them is ways in which they can help me engage in hedonistic enjoyment such that I can obtain the rest and relaxation I am looking for. From a philosophy of this nature, we tend to build a bubble, a fantasy of sorts. And within this fantasy, we block out the poverty that we see at these destinations. We block out the environmental degradation that we see at these destinations. We even block out the utter sadness in the eyes of the people that are serving us at the destinations we are visiting. And we convince ourselves that the plastered smiles they have on their faces are the true indication of their state of mind. We justify this by saying, well, poverty, what can I do about it? I'm on vacation. Appropriate action, ignore. Environmental degradation, it's inevitable. What can I do about it? Appropriate action, ignore. Now, some of you might have stopped listening at this point. <laughs> Others might have closed their eyes and joined back to that happy vacation place we talked about earlier. But for those of you who are still listening, I am confident that I can convince you that if we were indeed to think of tourism and our touristic engagement in tourism as a privilege we do not deserve, an 
and a right we have yet to earn. That we're more likely to yield positive health benefits for us, but also positive benefits for the communities that we are visiting. For such a perspective, if we adopt such a perspective, we're more likely <coughs> to not view these destinations as a dumping ground for our stress. We're less likely to view them as a dumping ground for our stress. We're less likely to ignore the realities of the people within those locales. We're on the other hand more likely to think of self-transformation, personal growth as a result of truly genuinely engaging with the people at these locales. We're more likely to think of helping others in these destinations as we help ourselves. Now this notion of helping, this notion of serving is not new to any of you. In fact, I would argue that most of you actually engage in some level of humanistic or philanthropic endeavor on a day-to-day -day basis within your home communities. But often what happens, what happens is as we contemplate the touristic realm, we tend to leave that altruistic sense of self at home on a staycation while we go on to our vacation. When in fact, the merging of these two selves puts us in a state of mind that allows us to better reap the health benefits that one would derive from such experiences and to better contribute positively to the communities that we are visiting. Now, you might say, is it actually possible for us to contemplate altruism and hedonism within the context of tourism? I would say yes. In fact, we have three examples that I'd like to share with you guys today. First, I'd like to go back to the classical era. As we think of this particular period, Roman scholars traveled, and their purpose of travel was just a little bit of hedonism, but to a great extent, they were looking for edification. Edification being moral and intellectual improvement. And this wasn't just for the self. This was actually to enable them to share their acquired intellectual capabilities with society. So here's an example in which we actually see serving self and serving others taking place within a touristic encounter. Another example I'd like to share with you is that of pilgrimage tourism. Pilgrimage tourism is travel to a religious event or a religious site. The World Tourism Organization states that 160 million people engage in this particular activity. They go for moral purposes, of course. They look for a higher meaning in life, of course. My own work in India, actually, in the Kumbh Mela, indicates that they also are looking for the ability to serve others as well as to be served. Regardless of the social stratifications that define that society as well as ours, people were willing to serve others, no matter who they were, and be able to be served as well. Now, there is a level of hedonism happening here. Maybe it's religiously themed, but people have fun while they're at, at these particular um, destinations. But it's also yet another example where we see the combination of a level of hedonism with something, a higher purpose that people are looking for. Voluntourism. We have an expert here, Dr. Kathy Andrek, who works on this particular topic. The Tourism Research and Marketing Organization states that 100, sorry, 1.6 million individuals engage in this particular activity. Well, in tourism, as the term connotes, involves people traveling to help others. They're building clinics, they're building schools, they're building all sorts of different uh, buildings that are required by the community that they're visiting. They're looking for a deeper meaning, yes. They engage in a little bit of hedonism, of course. They go on day trips and weekend uh, trips of one form or, or another. But they like this opportunity to actually be able to engage, genuinely engage with locals. They like the ability to be able to hone a skill or, or enhance a skill that they, that they have um, uh, attained. 
So volunteerism and tourism are two quintessential examples. Volunteerism, I'm sorry, and pilgrimage tourism as well as um, the scholars area are three examples that showcase the ways in which we can actually contemplate this notion of altruism and hedonism taking place within the context of tourism. Now, you'd ask, this all makes sense. So why is it that we do not have many more individuals engaging in this form of travel? I would say it has to do with the fact that we have yet to fully comprehend the health benefits associated with this form of travel. Stephanie Brown, a psychologist at Stony Brook University, does a lot of work on this notion of helping behavior. Her research has actually indicated that individuals that engage in helping behavior are happier, they're healthier, they live longer lives, they have a higher purpose to life, and they're able to better buffer stress. She's done some research with an elderly group of, 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 of participants, and she compared those who engaged in helping behavior those who did not engage in helping behavior. And by far, those who actually engaged in helping behavior lived longer lives. Michael Pollan at the University of Buffalo has done similar research and agrees regarding the health benefits, but says those who are most likely to reap the benefits of the, the health benefits articulated by Stephanie Brown are individuals that view others in a positive light. In a positive light. So if we go back to our discussion earlier, of the fact that we typically tend to view our engagement in touristic activities and our view of tourism destinations from a perspective where we view our engagement as a privilege that we deserve and a right that we have earned, which is very self-centered, right? And often renders the other invisible. If we do not see the other, we do not value the other. If we do not value the other, we cannot help the other. If we cannot help the other, we are unable to reap the health benefits articulated by Stephen Brown, Stephanie Brown and Michael Pullen. So I hope at this point you have actually gained an appreciation for the importance for us as a society to actually view our touristic engagements from a philosophy where we view our role as a privilege we do not deserve and a right we have yet to earn. For such a perspective allows us to act from a place of humility. It allows us to actually genuinely consider our engagement, our encounter with the people at the destinations we actually visited. It enables us to not just reap the health benefits that we tend to think of uh, by engaging in tourism, but at the same token, helping the destinations that we're visiting. In my mind, it is the very prerequisite required for us to even begin contemplating sustainable tourism, but also contemplating the sustainability of our planet. I'd like to end my talk today by sharing with you a very famous quote by JFK. Ask not what your nation can do for you, but what you can do for your nation. And I'd like to adapt that to the context of tourism. And what I would say would be the following. Ask not what the tourism destinations can do for you, but what you can do for yourself and the tourism destinations. Thank you. probably got the impression um, one of the primary areas we focus on in our school is this area of sustainable tourism. And the whole point of sustainable tourism is to um, mitigate the negative impacts that tourism can have on a community, um, but enhance the positive impacts it can have. And we can all do that as tourists. And, um, so always keep in mind that you, know, you can have a great time on vacation, right? but you can do a lot for the communities that you're visiting to. Right, so, our next uh, speaker this evening is one of our faculty members who's been at ASU for a number of years. Um, 
And, and Dave White, I, I met Dave before he was even done with his doctorate. He started here the year before he finished. Um, and so he spent pretty much his entire academic career here at ASU. And, you know, we've done some work together in a variety of, of places. Um, Dave started getting really involved in this area of water policy um, somewhat more recently in his career, but now is, is definitely an expert in this area of water policy. Um, and he is the co-director of the Decision Center for a Desert City, which some of you may have heard of. The Decision Center is over at the Tempe campus. So Dave's going to talk to you a little bit tonight about uh, water policy and water issues. Okay, um, before I start, I just want to say what amazing jobs my two uh, colleagues did. Uh, those talks were really fantastic, very passionate and inspirational, so I really appreciate that. Ladies and gentlemen, we have a water crisis in Arizona, but it's not the crisis that you think of. It's not a water supply crisis. We have adequate water supplies in Arizona to satisfy all of our municipal and urban demands, and nearly all of our agricultural demands for decades to come. It is not a water demand crisis. As I'll explain tonight, we have cut municipal water use in Arizona, in our region, in our cities, by more than 30% in the last 15 years. The crisis is a crisis of leadership. The reason that Arizona has such a resilient water system today is because of decisions and political actions taken by our leaders more than 30 years ago. As early as the 1980s, we adopted some of the most progressive policies, yes, progressive policies in Arizona, <laughs> that ensured that we would acquire the surface water rights, that we would protect our vast groundwater reserves, and that we would encourage municipal conservation. Those progressive policies have allowed us to address the critical challenges that we have faced, and it is the, the reason why we here in Arizona are not facing the same situation that they are in California right now. California failed at that time to enact similar legislation, and California is hoping to get legislation similar to that in Arizona passed by 2025. Right now. So there's a water crisis in Arizona, but it's a crisis of leadership. We need new leaders who can understand complexity, can understand trade-offs, and can communicate these issues to the public and to different constituencies. And I will argue that it is the responsibility of the College of Public Service and Community Solutions and the stakeholder partners with which we work to develop this leadership capacity because the solutions for the next 100 years are not the same solutions that we have employed for the prior century. We need a new set of solutions because of a new set of challenges. So I've argued that there's not a water crisis, but we are experiencing some significant challenges. And I'd like to review some of those challenges tonight. In this talk, I'll highlight a few of these challenges that are approaching us in the coming decades and to argue for the critical solutions that we face. First of all, let me highlight the role of a new study that was published by NASA, which suggests that in the 21st century, the American Southwest will experience droughts that have been unheard of in the last 1,000 years. This research suggests that so-called mega droughts lasting 20, 30, or 40 years are becoming increasingly likely by the middle of the century. Scientists have used information gleaned from looking at over a thousand years of records from tree rings, and they have combined these <laughs> records from tree ring data with information on soil moisture derived from over a dozen different general circulation models or climate change models. And they use this information to project into the future using advanced supercomputing capacity. And what these climate change model projections show unequivocally is that we will be experiencing warming trends and drying trends in the American Southwest. These trends will occur as a direct result of greenhouse gas emissions, 
tied to human-induced climate change. The good news for us is that our system has worked really well up until now. But we need to adapt a new set of solutions. Let's focus a little bit on our region in the Colorado River Basin. The Colorado River Basin provides water to more than 40 million people in the western United States and a range of other ecosystem services. But the cities within the Colorado River Basin are experiencing rapid population growth and urbanization and we are experiencing a variety of impacts as indicated by the 2014 National Climate Assessment, which show that this urbanization, along with the drying and warming trends, will present significant challenges to our current status. Now, let's focus a little bit on our situation here in Arizona. We hear a lot about the water crisis, and we hear a lot about a water crisis in Arizona. Smithsonian Magazine suggests that we only have four years of water left. In his influential book, New York Times columnist Andrew Ross suggested that Arizona and Phoenix was the world's least sustainable city, in part because of our limited water supplies. Arizona is in for serious challenges, but we have seen policies like the 1980 Groundwater Management Act, which reduced our reliance on groundwater, encouraged conservation, and protected our resources for the current generation. We built infrastructure, like the Central Arizona Project Canal. We built dams and reservoirs on the salt system, the Verde system, that allow us to store our water during high water years and deliver that water during low water years. Our residential conservation has been so successful that for the city of Phoenix, during the last 15 years, we added 400,000 new residents and delivered the total same amount of water. We're able to do this while also supporting a vibrant agricultural economy. If you eat lettuce in the winter in the United States, that's coming from Arizona. 90% of all leafy green vegetables produced in the United States between November and March are grown here in Arizona. We've supported a vibrant tourism economy with some of the world's best golf courses, the vast majority of which are watered using recycled or reclaimed excellent. In central Arizona, we recycle 90% of all wastewater and put that water to another beneficial use, many times put to multiple different beneficial uses. So we've had some successes, but we do have challenges, and those challenges will rely on new leadership and new solutions. Where will Arizona's new water leaders come from? The Arizona Republic has recently run an article that identified this crisis, suggesting that our water leaders are retiring, and there are not enough young people being trained to take their place. So we're facing this crisis of leadership. We need to develop these new leaders who can understand complex problems, understand trade-offs, and develop these new solutions. Where will they come from? Well, one place they'll come from is from Arizona State University and from the people that we work with and we train. At my group at the Decision Center for Desert City, which is part of the Global Institute of Sustainability and is a partnership between the School of Community Resources and Development, the College of Public Service and Community Solutions, and a variety, over a dozen different academic departments around ASU. We have been working to train this next generation of leaders. So I'll talk about a couple of our initiatives right now. One is using a systems dynamics model of the central Arizona area that we've developed as part of our research, research center. It's called Water Center. And what WaterSim does is it allows people to create scenarios of the future. And these scenarios take into account things like drought, climate change, population growth. It's based on the best available science that we have. And it allows us to peer into the future and anticipate the potential impacts of various different changes in our water situation and potential solutions. And to evaluate those trade-offs. Now, we're using WaterSim in a variety of different contexts, including training students such as those at ASU Prep here in downtown Phoenix. 
We developed curriculum along with a group of K through 12 teachers, and we're deploying that curriculum with these young students to get them excited about civics, about governance, and about leadership. We're also using this simulation model to train Arizona State University students. So we're working with students in community resources and development, and public <coughs> administration, and geography and sustainability, in disciplines across the university, and trying to teach them a key insight about this challenge, and that is, Complex problems require complex solutions. There are no silver bullets to this particular problem. For instance, if we eliminate all golf courses in the valley, which is a common solution that I hear, what would that do to our tourism economy? People don't know, many of them, that almost all of that water for that golf course is reclaimed or, or recycled effluent, recycled waste. If we zero escape, the entire city of Phoenix, if we eliminate all of the lawns and beautiful trees that we value in our neighborhoods, how will that exacerbate the urban heat island effect, which can actually cause additional water use because of the need for power generation, for air conditioners, okay? complex trade-offs. If we eliminate agriculture as a large consumer of water, which many people advocate, how will that affect the economy and the cultural identity of the rural communities in Arizona that have been developed as farming towns. Each of these possible solutions has consequences on other parts of the system. And only by understanding this system in its full complexity can we begin to look for solutions that have co-benefits, solutions that have synergies across different areas, solutions that save water and energy. Solutions that save water and produce better and more food. Solutions that save water and produce better touristic experiences. These kinds of solutions are the things that we need to develop as a community. Some of the other things that we're working on, I want to give just a couple examples of the kinds of creative, innovative solutions that are being developed by ASU and our partners. Working with the city of Phoenix, we've helped them to try to understand the implications of water sharing agreements between our different cities within the region. The city of Phoenix and the city of Tucson recently announced a water sharing agreement whereby Phoenix will send some of our surface water supplies that right now are considered excess supplies. We actually have far more water rights than we can use in Phoenix now. So we're going to send some of that surface water down to Tucson. Tucson is going to take that water and recharge it into the groundwater aquifer down there. Why? Because they have a vast, extensive network of groundwater pumping wells in Tucson. We don't really have that network here. So put that surface water underground in Tucson and let them pump it back up. Makes it cheaper for them because it reduces their energy costs. And it solves a problem by using water that we don't really have a use for right now. Then Tucson trades us back the rights to their surface water in future years. Creative institutional solution that Mayor Stanton and the City of Phoenix Water Services Director, Catherine Sorensen, developed with their counterparts down in Tucson. The Central Arizona Project, along with the Department of the Interior and several western states, have new programs to pay farmers on the Colorado River to fallow marginal lands and allow them to leave the water that they're not using in the reservoirs to try and bolster the, le the level of those reservoirs in Lake Powell and Lake Mead. Until last year, when the Central Arizona Project and those farmers agreed to that, you've never been able to do that in Arizona. For the past 70 years, we couldn't save water and leave it in the reservoir system. We have a use it or lose it mentality with water rights. In it. That's a creative new institutional arrangement. These things are bubbling up from the people who have been trained and been experienced with this system, but we need to cultivate those new leaders for this next generation. So in closing, I just want to say that there's no water supply crisis right now. There's no water demand crisis right now. But there is a leadership crisis. And it's incumbent upon the School of Community Resources and Development, the College of Public Service and Community Solution, and all of the partners in our community to develop the capacity to solve this problem into the future. Thank you.